this one because it's like, yeah. I mean, I think I the bank yeah. wouldn't. I think we can get started. Money uh, due to, like, the I think you you have already experienced the how computationally intensive the the processing of uh, <laughs> of the structure from motion is. So so we will discuss today uh, a little bit of high performance computing, some some basic terms, uh, how it is performed, how you can uh, uh, and. How, how does different softwares deal deal with different uh, approaches to uh, high performance computing? So that will be one part of, of today's presentation and the, or today's lecture. And then we will discuss uh, the current state of uh, open source uh, UAS processing. And then on Thursday, we will try some of the tools that Anna will be describing now uh, uh, like hands-on, try some of these different environments uh, uh, for for processing and and for essentially even like dealing with the software. And we will be will you describe like what they need to set up for yeah, VCL? Yeah. Okay, so so yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so as Helena said, um, you probably don't want to uh, keep processing your data, UAS data on your laptops. So. Um, so in this lecture, I will try to maybe shed some light on uh, general parallel computing concepts uh, uh, and the infrastructure. So high performance computing is kind of a buzzword, but actually there are other, and cloud of course is a buzzword. So uh, I would like to kind of explain what's what's actually behind it and what's the difference. And also how how it actually relates to uh, software licensing and why uh, open source software is actually uh, quite advantageous for these uh, high performance computing environments, which leads us then to uh, a kind of overview of open source tools uh, for US processing and maybe um, what's the entire ecosystem of these different libraries and tools. And we will specifically then uh, look at open draw map, uh, which we will be using in the assignment. Um, so first I would like to talk about parallel computing or parallel processing. Um, so normally you are used to do some geospatial computations probably. And uh, you notice that all the, the whole structure from motion pipeline takes a lot of time uh, more than you would probably expect uh, when you do your normal geospatial analysis things. So um, how we can actually fix this is using parallel processing. Basically, parallel processing has been uh, really important in the past uh, decade or maybe two. I don't know, but it's 30 basically years. thirty years. <laughs> yes, but like now it's even more than before. More accessible, uh, absolutely. Because also the processors are actually not getting much faster. So you know the there is this law, um, Moore's law, Moore's law. Uh, but we are getting kind of close to uh, to the threshold where we can't get any any more faster with the uh, with the processors. So what we do is we just uh, throw a lot of them together and um, and that kind of changes the paradigm how we uh, how algorithms are written uh, and how we process uh, our data. So um, specifically for UAS, um, uh, the solution is parallel processing and um, also, uh, the algorithms themselves uh, for structure from motion are getting uh, more and more efficient. But that's that's an um, area of computer science which we don't really understand that much, um, or we can't do that much about it. Um, so there are different types of parallel processing. Uh, so the most common type uh, is uh, using CPUs. Uh, where um, your laptops probably have a couple of CPUs. Uh, my laptop has, for example, eight of them. Um, and uh, so that's the most common, uh, and I will talk about it later. Then we have GPUs, graphical processing units, uh, where uh, these have basically hundreds or thousands of 
they can run hundreds of or thousands of parallel processes. And again, your uh, laptop laptop may have a GPU. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, we have these clusters with nodes, and each node basically can have uh, multiple CPUs uh, or multiple GPUs. So you basically multiply the number of CPUs um, on each node by the number of nodes, and there can be hundreds of nodes uh, on a cluster. So, so this is just the basic. Yeah. Is that the high performance cluster? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Some of these terms can kind of get mixed up. Uh, so, I'm I'm not sure I'm saying them or explaining them technically like exactly correctly, but at least I think it should be okay for uh, for the class here. Um, so uh, CPUs. So we use CPUs a lot when we do um, geospatial computing. Uh, that's because uh, your computer, your normal laptop, or if you have a desktop, uh, it has, um, as I said, uh, let's say uh, 10 CPUs. Um, uh, however, uh, that doesn't mean that whenever you compute something, uh, it's actually using all of the CPUs. I think that's a common misconception. So whenever you, for example, run um, a tool in uh, some geospatial software, GRASS, uh, ArcMap, uh, QGIS, whatever, uh, then it really depends on the particular implementation of the algorithm, if it uses uh, multiple CPUs or not. Um, uh, it's likely uh, they don't use multiple CPUs. So uh, you can you can check that if it's not somewhere written, you can check that easily in your um, task managers. So this is just uh, on the picture, uh, an example where, um, so this is from my uh, system monitor where you can see I have eight of these CPUs, but I run some algorithm. In this case, I, I run r.sum, which computes solar radiation. And uh, here, it's basically just one CPU is uh, at 100%. Um, and the other ones are just, just kind of uh, lingering there and working on some other low-level uh, things, um, not, too, not too much. Um, and then with r.san, that's one of the algorithms which uh, actually has now implemented the uh, parallel processing within the algorithm. So you can set the number of cores it uses. And so if you set the number of cores to eight, so suddenly uh, it starts to all of the cores get uh, get utilized and you can see 100% on all of them. So that's one way how you can actually check uh, how the algorithm is working if it's actually using your CPUs do you get or a, not. Do you get an 800 or 700 percent increase in performance? Um, I will. Uh, that's Maybe actually on okay. on yeah. my other slide. Okay. Just the uh, yeah, um, yeah. So the parallelization can be done on different levels. So. Um, ideally, it's already implemented in the algorithm, like for example, in r.sun or uh, some other GRASS modules. I actually don't know about uh, ArcMap, uh, how, how that works in there. Um, but you can also do the parallelization yourself, uh, and sometimes it's not that difficult. Um, so in ArcMap, it depends on the tool. Some yeah, tools, that's pro yeah. it's probably the, the, the same. Uh, because uh, uh, because there are different uh, approaches to uh, the CPU parallelization. So uh, some of the kind of geospatial problems we have are um, called embarrassingly parallel. So this means it's very easy to actually parallelize them uh, because they represent kind of independent computations. So for example, here it's uh, again, I go with the example of r.san. Uh, imagine you want to compute uh, solar radiation for different hours of the day. So uh, these are independent things. So you can just run uh, each of these uh, computations separately, uh, but at the same time. 
So in this way, you can just uh, get it much faster and it's very easy to compute. Um, then um, for some problems, we can, uh, we can use an, a tiling approach where um, an example could be, for example, interpolation. Uh, there are interpolation, so you have points and you want to interpolate them into a raster and you can divide the uh, spatial domain into tiles and then process each tile separately. Uh, with some algorithms, you might need to consider overlaps so that uh, you can actually get a good match on the uh, wherever you then need to join the, the results together. For example, in case of interpolation, you need to have overlaps. Otherwise, you would, uh, when you would like to patch the individual results, you will uh, get into basically edges or discontinuities um, on the edges of results. Um, and uh, then uh, they are basically just the complex approaches, which really depend on the specific algorithms. Um, uh, for example, it's uh, it's generally pretty hard to parallelize a lot of hydrologic uh, models uh, because uh, if you imagine flow accumulation, uh, basically it all um, it's spatially interconnected. Uh, so you can't use the tiling approach and it's not embarrassingly, embarrassingly parallel problem either. Um, what uh, you can typically do with these problems is apply the tiling approach, but devise some fairly complex way to allow the tiles to communicate on the edge uh, with each other uh, using some more um, complex uh, communication protocols. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to comment on particle sampling. You might have heard about particle sampling. We did the, the flow simulation with particle sampling and it's an interesting uh, uh, type of code because from the point of view of the particle sampling, it is embarrassingly pa uh, uh, parallel problem because you just uh, run the simulation with different set of random samples. And then you just send each of these random samples to a different, uh, uh, to a different core or to a different processor. But, but you still need to handle the entire region at once. So if your entire region fits onto each core, then you are fine and you can just do the computation very uh, uh, efficiently and very accurately using the embarrassingly par as handling it as an embarrassingly parallel problem. But if you are computing a huge region, this is going to help you and you you would need much more complex approach like yeah. Anna described. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and, and this very much depends on the particular algorithm. Um, so you actually have to understand the algorithm to be able to, to parallelize, to, to parallelize it. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, both the tiling approach and embarrassing the parallel problems, um, you should be able to actually... Uh, uh, you can write a write, script, write a script do to, to do exactly. it. Actually, in the Python uh, assignment we had, in the optional one, there was, um, there was a code snippet which uh, basically creates the tiles and computes uh, uh, interpolation by uh, by in parallel for each tile. Um, so there are libraries to do it. In, for example, in Python, there is a lot of ways how you can um, fairly simply parallelize your computations. Um, so um, just to summarize the CPU parallelization, um, the benefits of, of this are uh, actually a lot of uh, our geospatial problems fall into the uh, first two categories, so are either embarrassingly parallel or can be can be um, used with the tiling approach. A lot of remote sensing stuff can be, for example, uh, done this way too. Um, uh, and as I said, it's it's fairly easy for um, normal users to parallelize their computations in this way, either using Python, as I mentioned, or background processing. So. Um, background processing. I know in um, in ArcMap you can somehow switch background processing so you can run probably multiple things at once. Uh, on Linux, it's uh, uh, even easier. Uh, I might show in the assignment. Um, 
how to do it. And um, but of course there are some problems uh, with this. Um, so with uh, with kind of all parallelization approaches, uh, there is an overhead uh, because you need to uh, launch all the processes, and that uh, that brings some overhead. And um, if you don't parallelize it correctly, you can actually end up in a situation where um, where you use all your cores, but it still runs slower than if you would just run it on one core. Um, and uh, also, uh, if you, for example, if r.sun or maybe some other different algorithms, if you uh, run it on eight cores, it doesn't necessarily mean the computations will be eight times faster um, because of the overhead. Um, and, and that's really specific to how the parallelization is implemented there. So you get a speed up, but you don't always get a, uh, uh, the, the speed up you expect. Uh, then um, uh, also, I think Helena mentioned this, um, let's say you have those eight cores and you, you want to run your computation on eight cores, but each, uh, each uh, computation requires certain uh, amount of memory because you want to have all your data in memory uh, to run fast. So uh, then you can end up with not enough memory on your uh, computer. So you have to balance the number of CPUs you can use and memory you have available. Okay. So then we have GPU computing and I actually don't know that much about it. Uh, so I can just give you some um, some broad uh, information. Uh, generally, GPU computing is uh, suitable for very large number of tasks, which are uh, very simply simple computationally uh, and don't require uh, much memory. Uh, specifically, uh, specifically, I learned that uh, if your if in your computation you use if statements. Uh, like decision uh, decision tree, then that's not um, that's not suitable for GPU computing. Um, then uh, one one big problem with GPU computing is um, the hardware that it's often hardware specific. So uh, maybe you have heard about uh, CUDA platform. Um, uh, so that's specific only for NVIDIA. So if your computer doesn't have NVIDIA card, then uh, basically the program which runs with CUDA is not going to work on your computer. And we actually saw this with one of the softwares we... Cold map. Yes, Cold map. that's exactly the problem. There are some platforms such as OpenCV, um, which um, are trying to do it uh, in the way that it runs on different um, hardware. So there are ways to do it. I think uh, probably Agisoft is using OpenCV uh, so that it can run on different uh, different graphic cards. And Actually, it crashes. It was my problem. You need to like uh, disable the open DL to not crash. It was my problem with crashing and what the, with this CUDA. I didn't yeah. I didn't know a lot about that. So I was on the forum and I was like, okay, they tell me to do that. I'm gonna do that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Crashing is uh, is a common problem I think with uh, with GPUs because of the hardware um, connection um, and uh, also uh, just writing uh, parallel programs with GPU computing is actually quite hard um, I think the the APIs uh, is and the technology is not developed um, to that point where it's easy for any user to actually just start using it which might become easier uh, in long term, as it becomes more uh, prevalent. Uh, but uh, for now, actually, when you try to write your program with with these GPU um, programming APIs, uh, it actually increases a lot the complexity of your code, and uh, it's less readable and just complex overall. And but it as changes I said, and becomes obsolete very quickly. Yes, so uh, and yeah, it becomes obsolete too. So this is, I think, still evolving field. I think in the future it will uh, become much easier uh, to 
to program for GPUs. Mm -hmm. So the last time I looked into this, you had to write your CUDA code in C, even if you were driving it with Python. Is that still true? Um, I I think there are um, you can write your CUDA code maybe in other languages, but I'm not sure. Um, I would think they. Um, I think I saw that you can do other languages, but as I said, I actually haven't tried to do anything with GPUs, so so I have limited uh, knowledge about this. Um, so um, so with this, uh, we can see that. Um, the different parts of the, the whole structure from motion pipeline, um, these are basically completely different algorithms running there. And they have a different, um, basically each part of the pipeline uh, can be parallelized in a different way. Um, so that's why, um, uh, for example, I think in the settings of uh, of uh, Agiso Photoscan, so there is uh, you can set if you want to use a GPU or if you want to use um, just CPUs, and the GPU you can switch on only for certain parts of the pipeline, specifically for image matching and the depth map uh, creation, uh, where it actually can can be used because GPUs uh, require specific, very specific ta types of of tasks. 